Last week at the end of service, we had a crazy all out four and a half minute party. It was just a, just a little taste of how heaven celebrates when someone who's been away from God comes home. Don Russell is a longtime member of this church and a board member many years, a godly spiritual leader. His daughter-in-law, Rita, sent me an email this week. She said, when I was talking to Don about it, he said he stood in the middle of the celebration, remembered the first board meeting with Brother Garrison, the pastor before me, now it's 32 years ago, where he asked the board what they wanted to see in the church. Don said, every man said, revival. As he looked around the church, the diversity and the party, he thought, it's happening now. Renee Donaldson told me a story of someone who said as they watched the celebration, they realized they felt this way about me when I came home. (laughs) You're right, we did. And today, I want to further explain the setting and the audience when Jesus told this story. In Jesus' day, there were a group of people called the Pharisees who were religious snobs. The Pharisees made rules, a code you had to follow in order to qualify for God's love. If you broke their rules, you were out. No forgiveness, no grace, no simple path to restoration. Jesus taught a different gospel, one that the Pharisees didn't like. Jesus spent time with and accepted people the Pharisees wouldn't be caught dead with. The Pharisees disqualified them from God's kingdom. Jesus included them and offered them hope. Jesus taught that every soul matters to God, that any and everyone qualifies for the love of God, regardless of their past failures. The Pharisees wanted to discredit and get rid of Jesus. They didn't like the fact that Jesus focused so much on lost people. They were more interested in preserving power and tradition and rules. Luke 15, the Pharisees were once again criticizing Jesus, this time for spending time with and eating with sinners. And in response, Jesus told three stories. The first was about a shepherd who had 100 sheep and left the 99 to find one who was missing. The second was about a woman with 10 coins who lost one. And she searched until she found the one coin and then had a celebration. At the end of each of these stories, to make sure his critics got it, Jesus clearly stated his point. At the end of the story about the sheep, Jesus said, I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. After the story about the coins, Jesus said, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. And then Jesus told the third story. The story of the prodigal son. Remember, his primary audience was church people who were critical, judgmental, and angry that Jesus spent time with sinners. There was a man with two sons. Jesus never gave the younger one a name, so I call him Bill. Bill was tired of living by dad's rules and dad's house, so he, he demanded his share of the inheritance now. He wanted to do his own thing. In their culture, that was the ultimate insult. It was like saying, Dad, I don't care if you die. I just want the money. We don't really know why, but Dad split the money and gave it to his boys. Rich and happy, Bill took off and went wild. He lost all the money partying, playing. Then hard times came. Bill had no money, no food, and was far from home. He got the only job he could get, the ultimate horrible job, working with pigs. He was in a pitiful situation. He was broke. He was hungry. He was alone. The Bible said no one gave him anything. The people who partied with him and helped spend the money were nowhere to be found. All Bill's plans failed. Doing things his way didn't work. So Bill made the decision to swallow his pride, return home, and throw himself on the mercy of his father. He said, I'll set out. Go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called one of your sons. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. It's a long walk home. And the whole way, Bill worried, what will dad say? How will dad respond? And that was answered 
As soon as Bill got inside of home, well, he was still a long way off. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Dad didn't even pay attention to that. He said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast. Let's celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they begin to celebrate. It's a beautiful picture of the love of a father and the love of our heavenly father. When you make the decision to come back to God, it kicks off a celebration. Your heavenly father loves you and he wants you home. Like all Jesus' stories, this one illustrates a principle. Bill represents people who leave home, who walk away from their faith and their relationship with their heavenly father. The dad in this story represents God. Bill came home, dad threw a party. It, it, was, it felt like the story was over and the listening crowd had to think, hey, nice story, Jesus. Thanks for sharing it. And then came the zinger. And I imagine the crowd getting quieter as Jesus continued. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants, asked him what's going on. Your brother has come, he replied. Your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And what you expect is the same thing that happened with the father. The older brother ran to the house and threw open the door. And when he saw his brother, he hugged him. Tears poured down his face. And over and over, through the sobs, he choked out, Welcome home. Welcome home. But that's not how it went. Instead, the story took an unexpected turn. The older brother became angry, refused to go in. So the father left the celebration, went out and pleaded with him. He answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I never disobeyed your order, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. By the way, I've eaten goat, and that's not much of a celebration. (laughs) But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. The older brother was angry with the father for so quickly and completely forgiving and accepting Bill. Now, this isn't going to be your favorite message, but we have to talk about this because this is the primary reason Jesus told the story. We like to focus on the prodigal returning home and the love of the father. But remember, the story wasn't told to sinners, but to church people with wrong attitudes. The older brother represents the Pharisees, and I'm afraid on occasion us, church people, who aren't quite as ready as our Heavenly Father to offer love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Jesus wanted the Pharisees and us to see ourselves in the older brother. And your response naturally is, not me, I'm not like Pharisee, no way. The older brother's attitude was, how dare you throw a party for him? Don't you remember what he did? Don't you remember how bad he hurt you? We can't just let him come back like nothing ever happened. That's not right. That's not fair. He left home. He left you. There is no way he should have a celebration. And where's my celebration? I've been working for you. I've been doing my part. And oh, by the way, I've been doing his part. I didn't get a party. Why in the world are we celebrating him? Does that sound familiar? Maybe you've heard it like this. We spend way too much time at our church trying to reach the lost. After all, I need to be fed. Hey, belly up to the table, get a fork and feed yourself. Reaching the lost may be important, but church is supposed to be for me. After all, I am a tithe paying member. By the way, every time somebody tells me that, I look it up. Never had one that did that said they did. You spend way too much time with sinners. Shouldn't we get your attention instead of them? You you care more about lost people than us. 
I was actually told this once by someone as they left our church. I'm tired of it. You spend way too much time on your projects. That's what some people call a prodigal, a project. I can understand welcoming people back, but they need to pay a price. They shouldn't walk in the door and expect everything to be right back the way it used to be. That's the attitude of the Pharisees and the attitude of the older brother. Now, here's the part that should really bother you. That attitude comes through to people who are away from home. And over and over I hear it, I'm worried, will the church people accept me? Will they forgive me? How are they going to act if I walk in? What are they going to say? My friend Joy said it this way in an email. Now here comes the really weird part. I'm not angry, upset, or think it's God's fault at all. I know God is real. I've experienced enough of him in my life to know that. It's other things about Christianity I'm unsure, I'm unsure about and don't trust. I know I need God. I'm just not sure I'm ready for church people. Ouch. Shouldn't be that way, should it? In my own informal and certainly not scientific study of those who, for whatever reason, have walked away from faith and church, their number one concern about coming back is not, will God forgive me? It's not, does God still love me? Their concern is being judged for the mistakes they've made, even as they're asking for and seeking forgiveness. Through this story, series, I've been sharing the story of my friend Lisa. Her story is particularly challenging to me uh, because she's been my friend for 25 years and is part of this church. She said, in the spring, we were having an all-church retreat. I didn't venture out very far beyond close friends and family socially. I was still very raw and afraid. We had to put on name tags. Mine now had my old last name on it. I felt odd being conspicuous like that after being married for six years. I felt like I had a scarlet letter on me. There was a woman walking towards us. I'd seen her before at church, but didn't know her name. She looked at my name tag and said, my husband has the cutest name for you people. What is it he calls you? Oh yeah, retreads. He calls you retreads. Isn't that cute? No, that's not cute. That's an ugly, entitled, sin-filled, unforgiving attitude that hurts the heart of God and hurts someone that I love and care about very much. That is one of the most unfeeling, un un insensitive comments I've ever heard a person make. You called Lisa a retread when God called her a forgiven daughter. Shame on you for pushing her away instead of welcoming her home. You're a discredit to our church and to the kingdom of God, and you'll stand before God for those words. The primary fear of prodigals I've talked to isn't whether God, their heavenly Father, will love and forgive them. It's whether you and I, supposed brothers and sisters, will love and forgive them. Lisa went on. My family wanted us to come. My pastor loved us, even knowing the things we'd done. He truly modeled every soul matter to God, every soul matter to him. I wanted to go back, but I still felt unworthy and uneasy being around the people I'd let down. I was committed to God, but afraid people still judged me. If I felt this unworthy, they must, they must think I'm unworthy as well. I never would have thought I'd end up living like this. I felt conviction and wanted to change, but I didn't know how to reconcile the mess my life was in. I missed the close relationship I had with family and friends. My family was amazingly never harsh or judgmental. There were no lectures or arguments. They just loved me and told me they missed me. I knew how they believed and felt. I felt conviction just being in their presence, seeing the hurt and confusion in their eyes. I was consumed with guilt over my choices. Pastor Rod called me one day on my way home from work and told me it's never too late to come home. He told me God loved me and he loved me and I should come back. I told him I loved him, but I wasn't ready. I wanted to figure out how to resolve this mess before I could face going back to church. Another of my friends wrote, I got pregnant, gave up my daughter for adoption. That was the most right thing I've ever done. Problem is the good Christian folk didn't see it that way. I was told I was an abomination to God 
and that God has no place for women like you. When people run away and then return home, Father God responds with unconditional love, immediate forgiveness, and amazing grace. God isn't the problem. The older brother attitude is the problem. This is the reason why people don't come back to church. The older brother attitude is judgmental and holier than thou. Well, you were out doing stupid things. I've been right here faithfully serving God. You got what you deserved. I've seen her kind before. It won't last long. Before you know it, she'll be right back doing the same old things. It's not worth the trouble. He'll never really change. I hope you learned your lesson. And in case you haven't, I'm going to remind you. Too many times, prodigals are welcomed home, not with open arms, but with questions and skepticism. And that's it. The number one reason prodigals don't return to church and to God. The problem isn't God. It's us. And just that thought should break your heart. And that was the point of Jesus' story. The dad offered forgiveness and grace. The older brother wanted discipline and punishment. Why? Well, Bill didn't just leave his dad. He also left his older brother. And that hurt. The older brother handled the rejection differently than the father. Instead of rejoicing at the reunion, he was angry at the rejection. It hurts when people turn their back on you. It hurts when they leave. As they do, they often leave harm with their words and their actions. When they come home, it reminds you of the hurt when they left. So instead of celebrating, the older brother attitude is skeptical. Instead of forgiving, the older brother attitude is resentful. Instead of gracious, the older brother attitude is selfish. I deserve the party. I've been here. I'm still here. You shouldn't have left. The father, remember he represents God, saddened by his older son's attitude, responded, my son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Your heavenly father says to you, I love you. I will continue to bless you. Fix your attitude. There's, this is time to celebrate. This is time to rejoice. The loss has been found. A sinner has come home. Throw a party. Celebrate. They're home. And that's it. That's the whole story of the prodigal son. Only took me four weeks to tell it. And Jesus stopped there. He didn't explain it to the Pharisees. He left it to them and us to wonder and ponder which person in the story am I most like? My question for you is, how are you going to respond when prodigals come home? Will you have the attitude of the father or will you be like the older brother? We're supposed to be the image of God in this world, agents of forgiveness and grace. But I want to remind you, the primary people reason people don't come home is because they see us not as the father, but as the older brother. I don't like this message. It hurts me too much to consider that maybe the reason people aren't coming home is because of me. So how are we going to act? How are we going to make sure we act like the father, not the older brother? Well, as a church and as individuals, I want to challenge you to choose a different attitude. In order to realign with the heart of God, here's what we must do. Number one, acknowledge your ugly tendency to act like the older brother. See, it's real easy to say, oh, I've watched those people do that and ignore something in yourself. It's a wise, mature follower of Jesus who's able to honestly assess themselves and see the ugly tendency. It's the most difficult step of all. We don't like to admit we're acting like Pharisees. One of my really good friends sent me this vulnerable email. I've never been the prodigal, but I've been the son who stayed home faithful to his father. I've had to learn some important, sometimes hard lessons about being the one who stayed home. I've had to learn to genuinely, joyfully celebrate with those who are returning and not begrudge them like the faithful son does in the Bible story. I used to be irritated that the returning brother gets all the honor. 
But as I've celebrated more people returning, I've realized that all my father's blessings have always been mine. And he honors me for my commitment and faithfulness to him in a way I would never trade for even a brief prodigal lifestyle. I've also learned how critical a role I play as one who stayed behind in accepting those who return. I know God is pleased when he sees me joining with him, creating a safe home for prodigals, for being thrilled to see them return. He's also charged me with the responsibility and honor of being a seeker of prodigals, something I quite honestly should do more. Like my wise friend, acknowledge your tendency to be like the judgmental older brother. Make a heart decision. Ask God to completely cut that out of you. Second, focus on forgiveness, not punishment. The prodigal coming home has already suffered enough. The consequences have been sufficient punishment. When they come home, instead of punishing them for the pain they caused or piling on to the consequences they've experienced, act like the Father and quickly forgive. You say, but Pastor Rod, you don't know how much they hurt me. You don't know the damage it caused. I understand I've been there. It hurts. But don't allow your past hurt to act as an excuse not to forgive. Decide to release that hurt. Try this. Act like the father in the story and forgive them before they come home. Make the decision right now to forgive. I have someone in my life who really hurt me as he left. This morning, as I do most mornings, I prayed and I forgave him again. He's not home, but I've already forgiven him. Respond with love, not lectures. We tend to seize the moment and lecture. Our thought is, They need to know how bad they hurt me. They need to learn the lesson so it won't happen again. Hey, they've already learned the lesson. That's why they came home. And all too often, your lectures disqualify your love. Let the Holy Spirit deal with the conviction issues. Don't act like the older brother. Open your arms wide with love. Love doesn't lecture. Love says, welcome home. Celebrate restoration. Don't relive rejection. We lecture and we want to punish because we're reliving the rejection. Uh, We felt pain when they rejected us and left. I've made this mistake. One of my biggest regrets. When I should have been celebrating, I was reliving hurt. And as a result, that prodigal headed right back down the road away from home. And my older brother... Attitude's the reason he isn't home. So if you were angry or offended at the party last week, this message is for you. The father ran down the road toward his son. He didn't wait on the porch. He was watching for him. Let's look for them with anxious anticipation. When someone comes in, don't make them sit alone. Don't let them stand for prayer alone. Walk with them every step of the way. Several years ago, a friend of mine called. He was, he was living on the other side of the country. He was in crisis. He was ready to make a life change. He called. I said, I'll be there tomorrow. It cost me a ton of money. For a matter of fact, for what I paid for the plane fare, they should have sold me the plane. When I got home, I was talking to Pastor Brian, and I asked him, how much would you spend? What's it worth to see him come home? Would you spend $1,000? What's it worth to see your son or your daughter come home? Would you sell your car? It's worth everything. When someone makes that first step back towards God, drop everything and walk with him. This is an excuse that will always work here. Every time. I'm sorry, Pastor Brad, I couldn't sing in the choir today. One of my friends I've been praying for came back to church. Sorry, I can't teach my connection class today. Someone I've been praying would come back to God is here. They're my priority. Hey, we'll cancel the class or turn it into a prayer meeting. They'll celebrate. That's the whole point. That's the reason why we're here. Miss everything. Sacrifice anything. Do whatever it takes when they're coming home. This has to be our attitude, the attitude of our Heavenly Father. No matter what, no matter when, no matter how, you can always come home. Always.
they don't deserve to come on, come back. Come on, you don't deserve God's love either. None of us deserve to be part of his family. We're only here because God had grace enough to forgive and love us and send his son to die for us. You're surrounded by people who were once far from God and found their way home. And I guess at one time or another, all of us were prodigals on some level. Thank God we were welcomed home. So this is what I keep in mind. Four simple words. This will help you. This is the four ways that I resolve to treat people coming home. I challenge you to make these four decisions. Number one, forgive. Don't allow the hurt to make you act like the older brother. Number two, love. Openly, enthusiastically, with your whole heart. Number three, celebrate. Heaven celebrates, we should celebrate. Throw a party, cook dinner, take pictures, laugh, cry, hug, shout, sing, dance. People who've been away from God should see us celebrate when they come home. And number four, include. Immediately include. They don't have to earn their way back in. They're home. They're part of the family. When you do that, you're not acting like the older brother. You're acting like the heavenly father. That's how he responded to you. He loves you. He forgives you. He celebrates you. And he makes you part of his family. If you're here and you're not in a right relationship with God, if you've been away from home, if you're watching online, you've been away, I want to apologize to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry we've given you reason to wonder how we'll react. I'm sorry we've acted like the older brother. Please forgive us. Forgive us for being judgmental. Our judgmental attitude is just as much sin as your sin. We're as, we are as in much as need of forgiveness as you. And we ask you to please forgive us. And no, we're committed to not being the older brother, but the heavenly father. Demonstrating the love of our heavenly father to you. Come home. If you've come home before and we were church jerks, come home again. We're different. We won't punish you or cheer when it looks like you're suffering a consequence. We won't say that's what you get. We won't lecture you. We will celebrate restoration and not go over past hurts. We will leave your past behind. The past is exactly that. That's why they call it the past. They call the past the past because it's past. We'll help you any way we can. We'll answer any question. We'll pray with you, cry with you, laugh with you, and learn with you. We will open our arms and open our hearts and say, welcome home. This series may be over, but the door is always open. No matter what, no matter when, no matter how, you can always come home. Always.